Hi, I'm James Robinson, and this is my stock pick of the week. Today we're going to talk about operations for uh, SEI Investment Company. And I define operations as how efficient a job the company does in creating goods and services to deliver to their customers. Really, that's what a, cost, a company has two, two functions, right? To create products of value for their clients and to create wealth for their shareholders. And so I look at those two things differently. And so we're going to go over all of the components that I think are important to operations and talk about why this company is so strong. One of the only reasons that I do this is because I think it's really cool that people from around the world are watching these videos and subscribing to me. Uh, it looks like from this map I have about nine countries so far identified where subscribers are from. So uh, wherever you're from in the world, if you take a second and just write down in the comments, hey, I'm from you know, New York City or from Moscow or from Stockholm, Sweden or Venice, Italy, wherever you're from, I just love to hear it. Just two or three words uh, means a lot. Thank you very much. The number one thing that I look at when I'm analyzing the operations for a company is net earnings as a percentage of revenue, which is also called margins. Um, why do I start there? Well, I think that the higher your net earnings are is an indication that you have some kind of consumer monopoly or you have some very significant competitive advantage. And if you're able to maintain that very high level of margins over the very long term, then I start to suspect that you have a durable competitive advantage. And if you follow Warren Buffett at all, you'll understand that that's what he's looking for. Companies with a durable competitive advantage that get a high return on assets. So this is where I start looking at things and it's really pretty simple. I actually ranked all of the thousand companies, roughly thousand companies, 950 companies that I've analyzed so far. And I rate, and I just came up with, okay, the top 10% of the companies have this sort of margins, the top 25% of companies have this sort of margins. And so I'm able to see very quickly where each company I look at stands in the continuum in terms of gross margins. And you can see here that this company has been since 2013 a fantastic performer in terms of gross margins. And the gross margins are effectively getting better, not worse, which means their competitive advantage is very, very durable. So this is one of the reasons why I think this company, SEI, uh, investment company, is the best company I've analyzed out of the 900 and whatever companies I've looked at so far. So obviously one of the goals of a, of a business is to earn profits and it's also an important measure, it's an important byproduct of a company that's operationally run very well. So it would be silly not to look closely at the earnings for this company and for every company. I look at earnings in two ways. I look at earnings total and I look at earnings per share. Um, earnings per share is can be manipulated because if you buy back a bunch of shares, you can have an, a growth in earnings even though earnings are flat. Um, so it is something that I look for, and that's why I look at both and compare them. In this case, this company's done a very solid job just in terms of total earnings. It's gone from you know less than 100, about $100 million in earnings in 2000 to you know $500 million of earnings this year. So they're going up, dramatic, going up well. Uh, another thing that I look at is how badly a company was affected by the recession in 2008. And you know this company didn't do great, but it also never lost money and it didn't do poorly. And since 2012, it's rebounded very, very strongly. 2000 and, uh, between 2018 and 2019, there was a slight downtick, but it was relatively minor, and I'm not really that concerned about it. Uh, I, when you look at earnings per share diluted, you can see that they've really gone up every year since 2011, and pretty dramatically so, but again, that's bolstered by the fact that they've been buying back shares all that time. So long story short, the earnings for this company are very good. They're generally growing over the long term. They tend to be relatively recession-proof, apparently, and they're buying back shares, which is goosing the profits. So I talk um, in all of my videos about what I call the four taxes and maybe it's some five taxes, but there are things that a business wants. So a company has to produce their product. So this company has total revenues, that's how much money they made. Then they have to produce their product. That's typically called cost of goods sold. Then after that, there's, net oper or there's uh, gross operating income. And that gross operating income can be taxed, what I call it, by how well your company is run, right? You can't really control your potentially your cost of goods sold, but you can control these tax areas that I call them. So those tax areas are selling and general administrative, plants and equipment, inventories, and research and development. And I like to have companies that do a really good job of controlling those four costs. So the first one in this instance is uh, selling and general administrative. This company is only kind of average in that category, and I'm going to talk more about why that is in a minute. But the good news is for the last two years, it's come down marginally. It's been in a very narrow band since, call it 2010. 
So, and, and by the way, it is lower since 2010 than it is now. It, it was higher in 2010 than it is now. So, Sounding General Administrative, it is what it is. This is a company that has to do a lot of administrative stuff by the very nature of what they do, which is investment advisory. And so you almost have to accept that that's just a cost of doing business in this industry. Plants and equipment, they're relatively low, but they aren't in the top 25%. They're pretty close to it. Again, that number's been pretty constant over time. I don't really worry about it because it's a relatively small number. Um, but there, you know, there are companies where it's a real big problem. But this company, it's, it's neither good nor bad. This slide is the reason that I'm not really worried about the fact that selling and gender administrative are a little higher than I would like. Not bad, but a little higher than I would like. This company has no inventory, so that's a cost that a lot of industries, a lot of companies have to bear. This company has none of that, no exposure whatsoever. And the same thing with R&D. I mean, there are pharmaceutical companies that spend, in Apple, that spend tremendous billions and billions of dollars in R&D. These guys spend not a penny on it. So it all balances out. When you look at those four taxes combined, you say, okay, well, that's not bad. They got a little bit higher SGNA than you'd like and a marginally higher plants and equipment, but then they have no R&D and no inventory. So it balances out to a very, very strong you know, position in what I call the four taxes. Generally, I'm gonna talk, I talk about interest payments and the effects of interest in the uh, balance sheet section um, that I'll be doing next. But I did wanna point out that in this case, this company pays a very, very tiny amount of money in interest because they have like 45 or $50 million of debt for a $7 billion company, for a company that makes $500 million a year. So debt is not significant, but what's very interesting here is that they actually have net interest income. So they have invested about $800 million in whatever they've invested in, and that money is throwing off more in interest income than they are paying in interest expense. And that's relatively rare, so I wanted to point it out because most companies don't have this sort of additional benefit to the bottom line. And um, I think they made something like $15 million in interest income last year. So three or 4% of their gross profits, but still it's kind of free money. Um, the other thing that I look at is interest expense. I want to get it, I want to be able to look at that in, in terms that are relative to the size of the firm. So when you look at this, you know, their interest expense um, as a percentage of operating income is virtually 0%, and therefore it's completely not worth talking about. The only reason I'm bringing it up is because they've got this extra source of income as a result of, of wisely investing their money. So let's go over sort of a summary of these gross, uh, of these uh, operating um, components. Gross margins are among the top 10% of the companies that I've looked at. They've been that high since around 2013, which implies there's a competitive, a durable competitive advantage, both a competitive advantage and that it's very durable. Um, earnings per share have gone up every year since 2010. Uh, since 2000, there have been only two years where earnings, and I'm talking about earnings per share, but total earnings, where earnings did not surpass the previous year. So in 20 years, they've had a couple of down ticks, never lost money, even through the recession. In the recession, they did very, very well. They continued to be profitable during the recession uh, of 2008, 9, and 10. Um, the company's SG&A, as well as plants and equipment, are at best average. Uh, actually, they're slightly better than average. They're not, they're not in the realm that I would be excited about. Um, but it's more than made up for by the fact that uh, there are no inventories and no revenue expense. And the company has net positive interest uh, income. So that's going to do it for operations. Uh, next, I'll be doing a video on um, dividends, and I'll be doing a, div a video on the balance sheet, which is really cash and debt. Thank you very much for watching.